Let's see here. I guess 40 pound. Oh, that's about 40 pound for sure. Oh, that one's about 32 and three quarter pounds. No, it's about 33 pounds. 30 pounds somewhere in there. That one's, that one's probably pushing 50. Um, single nuke, five framer. I'm gonna guess it's 20, 25 pound. Probably about where it should be. Hello folks, Jason Christman, JC's Bees, your Central Ohio beekeeper. Right now it's about eight o'clock in the morning on Friday. And uh, just came out, topped off some of the feeders. And uh, as you've seen, I'm checking the weights on the colonies. And I hope you're doing the same thing. Remember, I mentioned this a couple weeks ago, go around to the back of the colonies, lift them up, get used to filling the weight and how much they weigh. That way you're able to tell with a rough guess by lifting the back, how much food stores do the bees have? The nectar source is pretty much done, folks. The only thing that's really in bloom is aster. So with that, we have to feed. Feed, feed, feed. Now, somebody asked me the other day, is it possible that you can overfeed? Yeah, it is. Because that pollen that the bees are bringing in off of the aster, they're using that to, to raise bees that will, will overwinter, winter bees. And the queen's gonna need a place to put that brood. So if you go packing every frame full of honey, the queen's not gonna have that. So what you should do is leave a few frames empty for the queen to lay in. Um, personally, I like to leave them in the bottom box if the queen is still down there. And it's best practice that you make sure that the queen is still on the bottom box. Because if she's already at the top, she's not gonna move back down over winter. So make sure you put some food and uh, on the outside edges of your bottom box and leave some empty frames in the center of the bottom box for the queen to lay in. Don't fill them all with food. Now your top box and with the exception of the center frames in the bottom box, yes, pack it full. Keep feeding and feeding and feeding. And remember right now, two to one, you'll save your bees a lot of work. So for Let's see here, the last, I don't know, two months, two and a half months, I've been taking my daughter to work. She's working part-time at McDonald's. She just graduated um, over the summer. Um, she's working part-time at McDonald's. You can see her car right there, but we need to get new tires put on it for her, and we're gonna do that in the next week. But anyway, I take her to work uh, three days a week, and uh, there's this bush or shrubs that I've been eyeballing in the ditch. And the other day, I stopped and checked them out. Check this out. I've been meaning to stop. Look at all this, folks. This is Japanese knotweed. It's a very, very invasive plant. Great for bees, though, if you have them. I don't know if there would be any seed in that yet. Oh, that's all seed right there. Well, I'm gonna have to take me a little sample, ain't I, folks? Japanese knotweed, folks. Look at all of it. Very pretty to drive by and see. Uh, that's for sure. It's out in front of this old abandoned house. Just right off the side of the road. So my plans are is to take some of that seed and broadcast it around my property. And maybe some of the neighbors. Not weed is very invasive, but just like anything invasive, it can be managed. Um, it just becomes invasive when you become lazy. If you're not managing it, of course it's going to go hog wild and take off. So management is key. But uh, knotweed um, is a late source of nectar for the bees. I'm not sure of the exact timing here in Ohio that it blooms. 
but I'm gonna guess it's somewhere in August, September range, somewhere right in there. So maybe right before the goldenrod takes off. So that would be pretty sweet, huh? So I'm happy to have those seeds in my arsenal and I'll be putting them to use come springtime. So up here, let's take a walk up here. I'm actually a little bit of a, a seed hoarder. I ain't gonna lie to you. Got, look at the little weed bug. There's almost camo with the leaves in the background. Okay. So look at it. Oh, here her come. You see her daddy? Daddy, are we on video again? Gosh, you take that camera everywhere. <laughs> what are those, Ladybug? What are those? You want me to show you what them are? Huh? Let's show everybody what we got here. Earlier this summer, we got a weeping willow tree that it really needs to come down. Um, it got hit by lightning. There's not a whole lot left of it. So uh, I cut some limbs off of them, threw them in this bucket, just wanting to see if they would root. Obviously, <laughs> they did. I set this bucket with the water in it inside my little pollinator patch here, which is kind of dried up and ugly looking right at the moment. But I set, had it sitting right, right in there in that bare spot. And everything grew up around it and I kind of forgot about it until the other day. So I'm gonna try, rip some of these apart and get them planted. Um, Willow is a great early source uh, for the bees. So good plant to have around. But what I wanted to show you is all the poten potential here. Here we've got Echinacea, also known as coneflower. Looks a lot like this right here. And there's a baby coneflower. Well, if you take this, pop the head off. Let me see if I can do this and hold the camera all at the same time. Not doing a very good job at it, but I'm trying. Right there. There we go, folks. Look at that. What do you see? Seeds. Lots of echinacea seeds. These will be getting spread too. Sure, I want to keep this, keep them growing here where they are. I won't take all of them. But look at that. That's just potential. Potential for the pollinators. So if I take some of that. We'll just throw them back in there for now. And I mean, look at all of them here. They're just everywhere. Echinacea, echinacea, and some more. You just take your nail and get down inside of them. Now, when they first start to dry up, these can be hard and prickly, and you don't really want to shove your fingernail into them, but they've been dry for a few weeks now, so it, they're not super pokey and I can take my nail, push right in there, and break the seed head off. Now if we come over here, this is seed on the wing stem. Now if you take this, I'm going to do it here on my pants, so you can see. Look at that. All those seeds, folks, just from that one little pod. That's potential. Take those, put them in a bucket. Here's a better one. Let's watch the results. So you take this little tiny seed pod here from the wing stem. You break it open. Let's see how many seeds we get. From one little pod of wing stem. So I've got a bunch of those here as you can see. All this taller stuff here is wing stem. So if I take the wing stem seed, the echinacea seed, and the knotweed seed and mix them together, um, that's gonna be a great little uh, pollinator starter. And I've actually seen people take and mix up some mud, make some mud balls, mix in your seeds. All you gotta do is go around throwing mud balls and they sprout. Okay, so I got one other thing I'd like to talk to you about and that is a wind block. A wind block can be a huge advantage for your bees going into winter. You can see behind me, 
I've got some round bales. Round bales or square bales of hay can be a great way to make a simple wind block. One thing you want to keep in mind with hay bales though is mice or rodents like to hide in them during the winter time. So put a little bit of space between your bales and your hives if you do use hay bales for your wind block. Now some of you in town might already be using this option as a windbreak and that is a privacy fence. That is a great option as a wind block. You can also just buy a section of fence panel and put up behind your hives. Drive some tea stakes, you see the tea stake over here, drive a few of them in the ground, fasten the fence panel to the tea stakes and bam, instant wind block. Your next option is to have some evergreens to block the wind. That's what I use here at the house. Our property is lined with pine trees. Um, what you see behind me here is actually a, a cluster of cedar trees, but it's still a great alternative for a wind block. So there you go. There's a few options for you to think about as far as wind block, but I strongly encourage you to think about it and to put something into effect. Get your food on. If you ain't feeding, get it done. Um, at this point in the year, I really recommend that you feed inside the colony and not set up open feeders. Um, the reason for that being is yellow jackets. They're just nasty right now. We're going to start getting mornings that are too cold for the bees to get out and work, at least in large numbers. And any open feeders is just going to be a yellow jacket uh, attractant. And when you ain't got a whole lot of honeybees out at the feeder, then the yellow jackets take it over and before you know it you've got an infestation of yellow jackets and then when you remove the feeder now the yellow jackets are going to go to your beehives so I'd, I'd really shy away from the open feeding this time of year it's getting kind of late do a two to one feed inside the hive if you can um, if you have to set up a feeder in an empty box on top of your colony for now and feed in there um, the trick with that though is if it gets too cold, the bees aren't going to move up to drink down the syrup. So it's, it's got to be an equal balance of everything for it to work correctly. So make sure you take notes of what you're doing. Um, that way next year maybe you can make some adjustments and change things to make them work a little better. So thanks for watching, JC's Bees. Um, if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't. Thanks for watching, JC's Bees, and we'll see you next week, folks.